Hello and welcome to the Ali NOAA Climate Change Short Course. I'm David Herring, Director of Communications and Education with the NOAA's Climate Program Office. And on behalf of NOAA and our partners in the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, it's a pleasure to bring you this lineup of world-class climate science experts to give an overview on our modern understanding of Earth's climate system. In today's session, we're going to hear from Dr. Christopher Sabine from NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory, who's going to give a detailed overview on ocean acidification, our other carbon dioxide problem. Today, humans release about 70 million tons of carbon dioxide every day into the atmosphere, about a third of which goes into the ocean. The absorption of this carbon into the ocean has been contributing to a little known problem known as ocean acidification which, if the trend should continue, could lead to significant issues and implications for marine ecosystems worldwide. And so, uh, Dr. Sabine is going to give us a detailed look at how the problem is playing out and what the future holds for our ocean ecosystems. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Sabine for this look at ocean acidification, our other carbon dioxide problem. Today I'd like to talk to you about a topic that I'm, I'm very passionate about, the uptake of CO2 by the oceans and then commensurate uh, ocean acidification effects. Now the, the title that I put up here, which runs off the edge, um, the title that I put up here isn't quite the same as you saw in your published brochure. That's, that's because one of the points that I'd like to get across today is that the oceans breathe in the same way that you and I breathe. Right? So as you take in air in your lungs, the gas is exchanged between the atmosphere and your bloodstream that uh, allow us to stay alive. Well, the oceans actually do the same sort of thing. They breathe in and out each day. Now, one of the problems with that is that, uh, of course, we cannot really control which gases are brought into our gas stream. So even if you, for example, have never put a cigarette to your lips, if you're standing in a room full of smokers, then you're getting that secondhand smoke into your bloodstream. And that's basically what's happening to the oceans right now. Well, all right, not exactly. But basically, the room's a bit larger. We have the whole Earth. Um, but we've got close to 7 billion smokers in the world now that are burning fossil fuels, carbon in the form of, of coal and oil and natural gas at a rate that's like, you know, a six-pack-a-day smoker that's been on a 12-hour flight. We're burning fossil fuels at a rate that's unprecedented in history, and a lot of those gases are going into the oceans, and that's what we're concerned about. So just a brief outline of what I'd like to talk about today. I'll uh, start off talking about the ocean's role in controlling atmospheric CO2. And I do mean that controlling CO2. Resulting changes in ocean chemistry and how this ocean acidification then might affect marine organisms. And I'll try and end. I've, I've been told that, that my talks sometimes are rather depressing. So I'm going to try and give, end on, a, on what I hope is an upbeat note with some thoughts about what the future may hold and what we can do to perhaps change the trajectory we're on now. I should acknowledge that uh, the work that I'll be presenting today is, is a collective work of hundreds or even thousands of scientists and not just my own work. Um, so I should, I should acknowledge all those that contributed to this effort. The other thing I wanted to do, for those of you that feel a nap coming on, um, I thought I'd just start with my take-home message, and that is that there's growing evidence that the human release of carbon dioxide will have a profound impact on marine ecosystems. We are changing the global oceans and the things that live there. The question is that, is, are we as a society prepared to accept those changes, or do we want to modify our approaches to uh, try and minimize these impacts? So let me start off with a plot that hopefully most of you have seen, uh, or at least a portion of it, at least if you've been to some of the other seminars in previous weeks. This, this inset plot here shows the measured atmospheric CO2 concentration 
on the Big Island of Hawaii that was started by Dr. Charles David Keeling in the 1950s. And he was the first to actually document through high accuracy measurements this rise in atmospheric CO2 with time. Those measurements have been continued up through today so that in, over the last decade we've seen an increase of about 1.9 parts per million CO2 uh, per year. Now a part per million just simply is a measure of if you were to take a million molecules of air, that means that roughly 390 of those million molecules would be carbon dioxide. Most of those, of course, are nitrogen and oxygen, but those 390, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, actually have a huge impact on our climate, as you've heard over the past uh, few weeks if you've been coming to these lectures. Now, what's startling about this increase is that it's very unprecedented in, in geological history. This bigger plot here shows the changes in CO2 uh, over the last thousand years. We know this because of ice cores. So the ice, the air, gets trapped into ice bubbles that then get captured into the snow that falls in Greenland and Antarctica, for example. And then we can take a core of that, measure the CO2 concentration in those ancient atmospheres trapped in those bubbles, and that gives us an idea of the CO2 concentrations back in time. These records have actually gone back now as far as 850,000 years. And at no time during that 850,000 years has CO2 ever gotten above 280 parts per million until around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, over the last 11,000 years, this is just showing 1,000, but actually over the last 11,000 years since the last ice age, CO2 has been extremely constant at about 280 parts per million. This is when most of those, many of those organisms that live in the oceans have evolved. And they evolved in a period of very stable CO2 concentrations. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, as we've started burning fossil fuels, we've, we've seen this, this dramatic increase in CO2. And actually, since the 1950s, we've been measuring it directly. It started with this site here in Mauna Loa, but there are now uh, well over uh, 200 sites around the world that are measuring this. The reason for that increase, of course, is the burning of fossil fuels. The, the summary from the last decade, the year 2000 to 2009, the average fossil fuel emissions was about 7.7 .7 petagrams of carbon per year. Now, I, I give these talks all the time, and I say 7.7 .7 petagrams, and people look at me, huh? <laughs> I mean, how many people know what a petagram of carbon is? And does it help if I tell you it's 10 to the 15th grams? OK. How about a billion metric tons? That, that at least maybe makes you think, well, it's maybe a large number. So I'm kind of trying out, you guys are my guinea pigs. I'm trying out an, an analogy here, see how it works. So I'd like to have you think about a railroad hopper car full of coal, OK? So just imagine this car. It holds about 100 US tons of coal, which is about 80% carbon, OK? That railroad car is about 60 feet long, if you include the couplings. So the question that I pose to you today is, how long do you think a train would have to be to hold one petagram of carbon? Anyone have any guesses? Well, it turns out, if you go through the math, that train would be 156,000 miles, 156,500 miles long. Now, to put that in perspective, the circumference of the Earth at the equator is almost 25,000 miles. So that train holding just one petagram of carbon would wrap all the way around the Earth six times. We're producing 7.7 .7 petagrams of carbon per year. We add on top of that the CO2 that's released from burning from uh, deforestation. Global deforestation right now is about 73,000 kilometers squared per year. That's about the size of the area of Panama, the, the country of Panama, that we're cutting down each year and burning. This, this num that releases about 1.1 petagrams of carbon per year. That, that, that number is actually lower than it was the previous decade when it was 1.5. But it's still a significant amount. 
Together, this accounts for almost nine petagrams of carbon. So just imagine that train now, every year, wrapping all the way around the Earth 54 times. That's how much CO2 we're releasing into the atmosphere. I feel like I'm coming and going here. About half of that CO2 remains in the atmosphere each year. The rest gets distributed evenly between the land and the oceans. Now, I'm an oceanographer, so I'm going to focus the rest of my talk here on the oceans. I could give you a whole other lecture on what happens in the atmosphere and the land, but I think you've heard some of that. So the oceans are taking up about 2.3 petagrams of carbon per year. That's the equivalent of this railroad hopper car dumping one of those hopper cars into the ocean every second of every day throughout the year. Now, the oceans are critically important in regulating atmospheric CO2 and CO2 in the atmosphere. That, that's because there are four pools of carbon that readily exchange CO2 on time scales that are relevant for our discussions here, that is, decades to centuries. The atmosphere, of course, exchanges CO2 very quickly. The land plants uh, exchange CO2 seasonally as they grow and die. The soils, all that, that leaf litter that the trees drop in the winter, that all contains carbon, so they exchange CO2 readily. And then there's the ocean. And you see from this plot that of these four components, 90% of all the natural carbon in the world is found in the ocean. That's, that's 38,000 petagrams of carbon stored in the ocean. We've added about 148 petagrams of carbon to that over the last 200 years from burning fossil fuels. So we're very concerned about how CO2 cycles through the oceans and whether that's going to change because if this CO2 were to actually come back out of the oceans, that could completely overwhelm anything that we're doing as humans. That man-made CO2 I mentioned, the 148 petagrams, is our estimate for uh, uh, 2008, is not distributed evenly in the oceans. This is a plot of what we call a column inventory of anthropogenic CO2, or man-made CO2. So if you take one square meter, each square meter of the surface of the ocean, and you add up all the man-made CO2 between the surface and the bottom of the ocean, this, this is what this plot is showing. So it's just looking from the top how much man-made CO2 is stored there. And you can see it's not even, that, that the highest uh, inventories of CO2 are found, for example, in the North Atlantic. We have very high inventories in the Arctic Ocean, relatively small inventories in the Pacific. The reason for that is because the ocean acts kind of as a two-layer system. The CO2 is diffusing into the ocean pretty much everywhere, right? So CO2 is in the atmosphere, it mixes very quickly. It diffuses into the ocean wherever the, the surface of the ocean touches the atmosphere. But what limits how quickly that CO2 can move into the ocean interior is how quickly is, is it's limited by the areas where water is moving down into the ocean interior. And that really only happens in the high latitudes. For example, in the North Atlantic, think of warm tropical waters in the Atlantic. They get, from the spinning of the earth, they get pushed over into the western basin and they move up along the east coast in the Gulf Stream, right? The Gulf Stream is a warm, salty current that flows from south to north. Uh, that CO2, or that, that water, as it's cooling off, as it moves north, is absorbing CO2. Cold water holds more CO2 than warm water, right? So it's absorbing that man-made CO2. It gets up here, it starts to spread across the North Atlantic. As it gets south of Greenland and Iceland, that water has now become so cold that it sinks. It becomes more dense and it sinks down into the bottom of the ocean and it takes with it all that man-made CO2 that it's absorbed. So this is one of the few places on Earth where we see man-made CO2 has actually penetrated all the way to the bottom of the ocean, several miles down. The, the water that sinks then flows south and around Antarctica 
and eventually makes its way north into the North Pacific. That whole path takes about 1,200 years. Well, we've only been adding CO2 to the oceans for about 200 years. So most of the North Pacific, at least the deep waters, have, have never been exposed to the elevated CO2. And this provides another way that we can verify the, the atmospheric records that I showed you earlier, that we can see that path, we can see that trajectory in the oceans um, in following this man-made CO2 as it accumulates in the ocean. Okay? Now that's looking at the ocean interior. If we look at the surface ocean, we see that close to the surface, which actually is where most of the plants and animals live in the ocean, we see that CO2 is increasing at about the same rate as the atmosphere. So the red dots here show you the, the Mauna Loa atmospheric CO2 record that I showed you earlier. That's collected here on the Big Island. These are the atmospheric CO2. We've got a station that we've been monitoring for the last 20 years looking at the CO2 in the surface water at Station Aloha, just north of Oahu on the big, on, uh, in Hawaii. And the blue dots here show the, the surface water CO2 concentration. You can see a couple of things. First, it's, it's much more variable than the atmosphere. That's because the oceans mix much more slowly and because there's a lot of plant and animal life in the oceans that, that adjust the CO2 levels. We see changes not only seasonally, but also from one year to the next that have to do with large-scale circulation of the ocean waters. But in general, what we see here is, is the same as we see pretty much everywhere in the ocean, that the ocean surface water's CO2 concentrations are cr increasing lock and step with the atmosphere. They're increasing at about the same rate. Now commensurate with that increase in CO2, we see a drop in the ocean pH. pH is a measure of the acidity of, of, of a liquid. Um, for example, vinegar or lemon juice is acidic. Uh, Alka-Seltzer, if you put Alka-Seltzer in water, that's, that's a basic solution. Uh, lye, uh, sodium hydroxide is, is basic. The, the oceans you can see are basic. They're, they're above 7, which is neutral pH but the pH is dropping at a steady rate that we can actually document through measurements. Now the reason for that is because of chemistry. And I guess I, I have to apologize here. I'm, I'm a marine chemist. I cannot give a talk without showing some chemical equations. But it's only two slides, so don't go to sleep. And, and it's fairly simple chemistry, so hopefully uh, I won't lose you all here. But the idea is that CO2 when it diffuses into the ocean, it actually reacts with the water molecules to form what we call a carbonic acid. Okay? An acid is a compound that easily gives up hydrogen ions. This is actually what you're measuring when you measure the pH of a solution. You're measuring the, those hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions are extremely reactive. They can react with a number of different uh, molecules. That's what makes them important in term, determining pH. So most of those uh, hydrogen ions actually react with another compound that we commonly find in the ocean called carbonate ion. So the hydrogen reacts with the carbonate ion to form bicarbonate. That happens to about 99% of all the hydrogen formed. So some of those hydrogens stay as free hydrogens, which decrease the pH. But some of them, most of them, react with this carbonate to form bicarbonate. Now that's important, and I want you to keep that in mind for the rest of the talk, because this carbonate is critical for organisms that form calcium carbonate shells. Think about corals, uh, clams, oyster shells, you know, the white sand beaches of Hawaii. That's all calcium carbonate, and that's formed by organisms. So what they do is they take a dissolved calcium ion, they take a dissolved carbonate ion, they put the two together, and when you put those two compounds together, they actually make a solid called cal calcium carbonate. And that's the white part of the coral, the hard part of the coral that you see. That's the hard shells that you see uh, on your clams and oysters. It's the white cliffs of Dover, calcium carbonate. Now we've got a scientific index that we use to determine how easy or difficult it is for those organisms to produce that calcium carbonate. It's called the saturation state that we use the symbol omega to identify. 
And it's set up, it's just a ratio of the concentration of the dissolved species in solution together with the solubility product that, that determines for a different mineral phases how easy or difficult it is to form. And it's set up in such a way that uh, when you have omega values that are less than one, if you, if you put a, if you were to take this calcium carbonate and put it in a water that has an omega less than one, that, that, that carbonate skeleton would dissolve. If you have a value greater than one, that, that calcium carbonate will not dissolve. It could stay in there forever. And it's, it's uh, actually set up on a sliding scale so that organisms, the higher the number, the easier it is for organisms to produce their shells. So let's, let's look back over the last 200 years and see what's, what have we seen so far. Um, of course, we've seen this increase in CO2 in the oceans. We've seen a drop of about 0.1 pH units over the last 200 years. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, 0.1, but you have to remember that pH is on a log scale. It's, it's similar to the Richter scale that we use for earthquakes, right? So a change of one in pH is actually a tenfold increase in the acidity of the oceans. This 0.1 drop in pH unit actually represents about a 30% increase in the acidity of the ocean. Commensurate with that, we've seen about a 16% drop in this carbonate ion concentration that I talked to you about. And of course our concern is what's going to happen in the future. If we continue to burn fossil fuels at the rate that we are, we anticipate that by the end of this century, we could see about 150 to 200 percent increase in the acidity of the oceans and about a 50 percent loss of that carbonate ion concentration. So you can imagine that that would make it quite difficult for organisms to produce their shells and skeletons. And they're not doing that just for the fun of it. They're doing it to survive. If we look over a longer time scale, this is now in millions of years. So here's, here we are today at the zero, going back 25 million years. We can see that the pH of the oceans has been fairly constant, somewhere you know around 8.1 to maybe 8.3, within about 0.1 pH unit. Here's where we were in the, at the beginning of the pre-industrial, around 1800. Here's where we were in 2000. We've seen that 0.1 drop in pH units, but we're still more or less in the in the range of what we've seen geologically. And again, the concern is where we're going to go in the future. By the end of this century, we could see a drop of 0.3 pH units, which is lower than we've seen for at least the last 25 million years. And it's not just the magnitude of the change, it's also the rate of the change. You notice on this scale, these changes that have happened over geological history occur over tens of thousands or millions of years. The changes that we're implementing now are occurring on decades to centuries. It's, it's, it's up to a hundred times faster than we've ever seen in the geological past. Now, most people really don't care at all about ocean chemistry. I guess I'm, I'm an exception. What they care about, or what I hope you care about, are the, the plants and animals that live in the oceans. And we're just starting to study how this uh, CO2 might affect the organisms. Actually, it's kind of interesting. We, we've known about this, this whole process of ocean acidification for quite a while. But, but we chemists were sitting on one side saying, you know, oh, you know, as we add CO2, we're, we're changing the chemistry of the oceans. We've known that for decades. And the, and the biologists have been kind of sitting on the other side of the room saying, wow, you know, we've found that um, anyone that's, for example, had a saltwater aquarium knows that if you don't control the pH of your aquarium, pretty much everything dies in your aquarium, right? So they've known for years that, that pH is a very important uh, factor for controlling the health of marine organisms. But it really wasn't until just a few years ago that we started actually talking to each other and saying, oh, you think pH is important and I'm seeing pH changes and we had kind of that aha moment of, hmm, this, this could be important. Most of the studies, so, so there's just been an explosion of research done over the past decade, but it's still fairly young in terms of really understanding what's going to happen in the future. And most of those studies have been conducted in uh, 
aquariums, taking a single species and putting it in an aquarium and exposing it to elevated CO2 and seeing what happens. You know, basically torturing them. Uh, there have been a few mesocosm studies where we, we try and look at small patches of, of water and see what happens. Actually, one of the more interesting is, is biosphere. I, um, I actually just gave a talk to, uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, I gave a talk at the Seattle Art Institute, teaching science to artists. It was great. There were all these young kids out in the audience, and I pointed to biosphere and go, you all know who, what biosphere is. And they're like, nope, not a clue. So hopefully you guys know what biosphere is, but they really like the idea that, uh, you know, if we could build a whole Earth and put it on a spaceship and fly it out, that that'd be... Anyway, so I had to explain it. But hopefully I won't have to explain to you guys. But within, uh, within biosphere, it turns out that they, they had an ocean. And they actually had a tropical ocean that was full of corals. Here's an example of it. Here's a little zodiac just to kind of give you a scale. And of course, if you recall from, from your history books, the biosphere failed, right, because they didn't balance... The, the CO2 concentrations. Basically, the, the CO2 levels in the biosphere continued to increase, and the people that were living there actually had to evacuate early because they almost died from CO2 poisoning because the, the CO2 levels got so high in the biosphere. That actually, as it turns out, provided a very nice experiment for what we're doing to our global Earth here um, in terms of the tropical reefs. And what they found was that um, as the CO2 increased, so increasing CO2 decreases this omega saturation state that I told you about earlier, and as the CO2 increases towards the left, or the omega decreases, they saw a drop in the growth rate of the corals in that biosphere. And they've actually done studies now over in a bunch of different areas in the, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, in uh, the Indian Ocean, and all, basically all the reefs that we've studied so far show this decrease in the rate of growth, the rate at which they can produce their calcium carbonate skeletons uh, with decreasing saturation state. Now the, the rate at which they decrease is different in them all, but they all show this, this rate of decrease. So what we can do then is put that together with our chemistry measurements that I do, and we can compare uh, and, and project what might happen in the future. So what I've shown here in the top plot is a map of the saturation state of the waters uh, in, in the pre-industrial, so around 1800 when the atmospheric CO2 was around 280 parts per million. And the, the, um, the blue colors represent high omega values and the red colors represent low omega values. I've also put on here these little magenta dots that you see are the locations of all the known coral reefs in the world, the shallow warm water corals. What you see is that basically all of the corals grew up in this blue water. This is where they've got very high saturation states, so the scale is here on the bottom. And in these blue waters, those are the optimal growing conditions for corals. So all these reefs that have been forming over millions of years when the CO2 was very stable at 280 parts per million are all growing in this optimal growing condition. And this is just a histogram showing the distribution of the corals and what saturation states they're exposed to. So now we can move up to 380 parts per million. So that's an increase of 100 parts per million. We did that uh, in the early 2000s. So this, this is more or less representative of, of our oceans today. You can see, as we go back and forth, that the amount of blue in the area has dramatically decreased. The, the orange and yellow colors here represent kind of acceptable growth. They've, they've, they're signif growing significantly slower, but they are still growing, albeit at a slower rate. By the time we get down to the reds, basically they're not growing at all. And by the time you get down to these pink values, then they're, then they're actually starting to dissolve in place. So you can see there's quite a lot more red areas, um, but most of the corals are still in this kind of moderate to optimal range, about half and half. The problem is as we look out into the future, so here's where we expect to be by about 2020, 
so actually not that long from now, almost all the blue is gone. The corals are all pretty much in this uh, moderate range of orange to yellow. And then as we move out into the future, to where we expect to be by the end of this century, if we have CO2 concentrations of 750 parts per million, which believe me is a very modest number, basically all the corals are in this red range. They're not dead, they're just not growing. And when you have multiple stressors, they're not going to be able to recover from any, uh, any sort of events like storms or bleaching events that would impact them. And in fact, you see in the high latitude oceans all the way around Antarctica and in the Arctic, the surface waters are completely undersaturated so that any carbonate particles there would be dissolved. This is not all just completely theory. The, you've all heard of the Great Barrier Reef. It's a national treasure of Australia. It's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Austra the Australians have been monitoring the health of the, of the Great Barrier Reef for decades. One of the things that they measure, these are three different ways actually of measuring the growth rate of the calcium carbonate skeletons on the reef. Oh, this got cut off. This is actually the, um, so we've got the density, we've got the extension, and I'm forgetting now what that one is, but it's another measure of the, of the growth. And basically you see that starting in about 1990, um, the, the Great Barrier Reef has completely stopped growing. So for the last 20 years, there's been uh, a dramatic decrease in the growth rate of the, of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, calcification, thank you, yes. So this, this is the rate at which they're adding that calcium carbonate. This is, this is you can go actually go out with a, a ruler and measure how, how far they're growing. And the density, you know, is, is kind of, a, a lot of people have related uh, the ocean acidification impacts to something like osteoporosis, that basically you can start to, you still can grow, but your, your bones of the skeletons are less dense. Anyway, I'm not saying that this is completely all caused by ocean acidification. There are a number of different stressors on the corals, but as CO2 levels increase, that, that stress on the corals is continuing to go up. There have been a number of other studies that have done. This is just another example of some benthic organisms that have been studied in the, in the coastal waters. Um, you can see, and, and we see different effects from different organisms. That's you know, what you might expect. Not, this is, we're not talking about killing everything in the oceans. There will be winners and there will be losers. But the one thing that we can say is there definitely will be a change. So we see, for example, crustaceans, actually adult crustaceans, seem to do pretty well as you increase the CO2 or decrease the saturation state. So you're, your blue crabs might be all right. The problem is that these, this is looking at adults. One thing that we've found is that the juveniles and the larvae tend to be much more sensitive to changes than the adults. So there are studies that are just starting now to look at the juvenile species of these crustaceans. Now that kind of makes sense because we know that crustaceans, they don't actually build a pure calcium carbonate shell. Their shells are primarily um, chitinous, kind of like our fingernails with just a little bit of calcium carbonate. And we know that when they molt, they actually reabsorb that calcium carbonate into their bodies so that they can then apply it to their next um, shell. The rest of these all form pure calcium carbonate shells. Some of them we found uh, have this response where whether you increase or decrease the CO2, they seem to do worse. Um, but the most dramatic responses have been with the corals and the mollusks that clearly show a decrease at elevated CO2. I talked a little bit about the corals. Let me just give you an example about the mollusks from, from my area. The Pacific Northwest is, of course, a, a major shellfish growing area. These are the, the oysters that we've got in our area, a little bit different from your Chesapeake oysters. Um, and this represents, the, the commercial oyster hatcheries represent about a hundred million dollar a year industry. They employ about 3,000 people. The problem is that for the past six years, there's been zero recruitment of new baby oysters into the natural oyster beds. They've just completely stopped growing. And that's, of course, 
cause a bit of concern among the hatcheries. So we started working with the shellfish industry to try and understand what might be causing this and doing uh, carbon measurements to see if it might be ocean acidification that's affecting them. Now our theory was that um, what happens is in the Pacific Northwest we have what we call coastal upwelling. In the summer months the winds blow from the north along the coast with the spin of the earth what that does is it pushes the surface waters offshore. Those waters then get replaced by deep waters around 100 to 200 meters depth. They get brought up onto the continental shelf and actually come all the way up to the surface. And that's called upwelling. That upwelling brings with it waters that are naturally very high in CO2, low in pH, low saturation state. They're also low in oxygen. And that um, basically brings up CO2 and exposes the organisms to lower saturation states than they would be exposed to out in the open ocean uh, away from the upwelling. So what we did was we went out and we did some cruises along the west coast. We did a series of stations on and off the shore from Canada all the way down to Baja, Mexico, looking at the water chemistry. This is an example of one section, line five here, uh, right at the Oregon-California border. So what we're looking at is a cross section of the, of the water chemistry. The California coast is over here and offshore is over on the left. The surface is at the top going down to, in this case, 250 meters. Each of the red dots is where we took measurements. The colors here show the temperature of the waters. So normally you would expect the ocean, these, all these colors to be horizontal all the way across. We know the deep ocean is colder than the surface ocean, but those levels are generally horizontal. But this upwelling, you can see, brings up this cold water from below up onto the continental shelf. Now together with that, we see, uh, we measured the aragonite saturation state. Remember I showed you that when you get below one, that's when you can actually dissolve calcium carbonate particles. And on this section, we saw uh, undersaturated waters getting all the way up to the, the coast. In fact, we saw that all up and down the west coast of the, of the United States. Uh, and even into Mexico a bit. Um, un and in fact, in this line, the satur undersaturated waters made it all the way to the surface. Up to this point, this cruise was in 2007, up to this point, the models were projecting that we wouldn't see undersaturated waters at the surface for another 50 years. But this upwelling has actually kind of short-circuited that and has brought up these, these undersaturated waters sooner than we expected. Commensurate with that, we also see that these waters have very low pH values. pH is down around 7.6, 7.7. So what we did was we went out and we were concerned that this upwelling might be bringing acidified water into where the shellfish hatcheries are, are operating. And in particular, the oysters seem to be very sensitive to uh, low pH right at the time when they start to settle out. So what happens is the oysters are, are what we call broadcast spawners, right? So they spew out their larvae, they float around all over the place. At some point, they then start to form their calcium carbonate shell. That shell makes them heavy, so they sink down. And if they happen to sink onto an area that has a nice hard substrate where they can grow, then they attach and they grow there, right? So what we found in laboratory studies is that these larvae when they're exposed to high CO2, they can't ever form that initial shell. So they never settle out and, they're, and they just float around basically until they die. So what we did was we, we put sensors onto buoys, onto moorings all around the Puget Sound area where I live, where I work. And we also put sensors in the shellfish hatcheries. So this, these are some data from the shellfish, from Taylor shellfish, which is uh, in the Puget Sound region. What they found is when the waters were from the south, right, which is the opposite of what I showed you before, from the south you do not have upwelling. They saw lower salinity waters. That means that there's more estuary waters from the rivers that are dumping into the estuary. And they had a very nice high survival of their, of their larvae at that time. 
they also saw the very high omega values. However, when they saw winds from the north, which favors that upwelling, which brings in that acidified water, they see higher salinity, which means more of that offshore deep water. They see low aragonite saturation values, and that's when they were getting the high mortality of the, of the oysters. So basically what we did was we worked with them to say, all right, you're monitoring this. When you see these low aragonite values, or, the, or the, the low pH values, turn the spigot off, right? So they're, they're pumping in seawater and pumping it through their tanks to, to feed these oysters. But basically that was what, was what was killing them. So what we did was we just had them, they would shut their spigot off during this time, and then they would turn it back on when the, when the waters were more favorable. And, and I'm happy to say that 2010 actually was their most productive year in the past six years when they started doing this. And they estimate that we saved them roughly $35 million last year by just timing when they turn the spigot on and off based on the, based on the saturation values. Now the problem is ocean acidification, it's a global problem. It's continuing to get worse. This works for now. But we're not sure how long it's going to work, because sooner or later, um, basically, the saturation states are going to decrease below all the time. It's not just shells, shellfish. It's also um, can propagate its way up into larger, uh, higher order life forms. For example, this is a, a nice little picture of a juvenile pink salmon. It lives, lives up in the Gulf of Alaska. And what we found is that 60, up to 60% of their diet is made of these little organisms here. These are another marine mollusk called a pteropod. And it's a, a nice little planktonic snail that swims around in the ocean all the time. It doesn't actually ever settle out. It swims around. It's about the size of your, of your pinky fingernail. And, and it makes up about 60% of the diet for these juvenile pink salmon. They went out and they studied these in the Gulf of Alaska. One year, those those pteropods didn't show up. And they found that the, the, they had a horrible recruitment that year for the pink salmon, that, that uh, their body weights were significantly lower than other years. And their diets, um, so they did actually make up uh, their diet with, with other organisms. The problem is all of these other organisms that they replaced the pteropods with are also things that we expect will be impacted by ocean acidification. So we're concerned that there'll be impacts on up the trophic level as time goes on. There's been a study looking at this uh, in terms of the US economy. Um, this is the catch value in millions of dollars. So the fishing industry accounts for about $3.8 billion per year just from the catch alone. When you, when you propagate that out to the restaurants cooking and selling the fish to you, that represents about a $34 billion a year industry. And this is uh, an estimate of which, which of those fisheries might be impacted by ocean acidification. The red, the red things are those mollusks that we were talking about. They represent about 20% of the industry. So uh, let's see. Here's the Atlantic. This would be you guys right here. Shellfish is a big piece of your, of your East Coast industry here. These other colors represent uh, where we expect to see indirect impacts. The blue, the blue colors here are the fisheries that we don't think, that we do not think will be impacted in the future. So I've just given you a little flavor of some of the things that we're seeing with, with the ocean acidification. We see uh, most of the work, I will remind you, has been done just on individual species. Of course, out in the open ocean, it's much more complex than that. You have a lot of different organisms that are all interacting with each other. But from these preliminary studies, we see reduced calcification rate. That's what I spent most of my time talking about. Um, on the positive side, we do see increased photosynthesis. We do see uh, that the plants, uh, some of the plants actually grow better, um, particularly the nitrogen fix fixers. Um, Kind of the bad side of that is a lot of these nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria um, are actually some of the organisms that cause harmful algal blooms, that cause red tides. Um, we see reduced growth, production, lifespan of adults in, in a few organisms, um, like squid seem to be very, 
strongly impacted by ocean acidification. In others, the adults seem to be okay, but we see impacts on the juveniles and the larvae. Um, we see reduced tolerance to other environmental fluctuations. So there seems to be kind of a synergy between the stress imposed from ocean acidification and other stresses. With corals, for example, most of what you hear about in the corals is coral bleaching. That's actually a temperature effect. But we've shown now through studies that um, the bleaching is actually much more dramatic in corals that are exposed to high CO2 than they, uh, when they're exposed to low CO2. So there seems to be kind of a synergy between those two stresses. We also see significant shifts in nutrients and trace elements. Uh, you know, pH, again, is a master variable that controls many things. If you change the pH of the oceans, you change, for example, um, copper becomes much more toxic in low pH water than in high pH water. Most of these studies have been done on individual species. What we really don't know is how that will affect entire ecosystems. You know, we anticipate that there will be some impacts on the fitness and survival of different uh, ecosystems. Changes in the biogeography as, as organisms are no longer able to live in one spot, they may move to another spot. Um, and that in turn will affect the food web structures and, and key biogeochemical uh, cycles. What I want to make sure and point out here is that the uncertainties on this are still quite large. This, this research is still fairly new. Um, the num amount of research that's being done is growing exponentially in the world, but um, we still have a lot to do. And so I want to temper my statements with that. So what, what, what might happen into the future? Um, we can try looking into some of the geological history to see what, might, what indications that might give us. This is a plot of the number of genera of species, so the, the, the total number of different types of organisms and plants in the world with time, starting back in the Precambrian about 500 million years ago and coming up to today. So you can see that the number of different organisms has been increasing with time. But there have been, I've marked in red here, five significant um, ocean acidification events that have happened in the geological past. Now, not all of these have been CO2. In fact, many of them were not. But in each one of these, rec each one of these ocean acidification events, we saw uh, a significant extinction in the ocean. So the one you just saw there was the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. So that's an example of one that's not a CO2 event. When the, the asteroid hit the Earth, it actually put up a bunch of sulfur gases, which then got oxidized to sulfuric acid, acidified the oceans. 98% of all life in the oceans died at that time. And in each one of these events, we have gaps in the geological record of coral reefs. So the nice thing about corals, they make these massive reef structures, which we can go back into the geological history and see, well, at least five times in the geological history, corals have been completely wiped out. They've, they've dissolved all the reefs that were at the surface, uh, in the surface ocean at that time, and it took them millions of years to re-evolve until the next ocean acidification event. So again, these are not perfect analogs because not all of them are CO2. The other point to make here is that in all of these cases, the changes that were seen were, at best, 100 times slower than what we're seeing now, right? So these, these events took tens of thousands of years to develop. We're adding CO2 and changing the pH of the oceans on time scales of decades to centuries. So we really don't know necessarily what's going to happen in the future. Again, I just want to touch very briefly on what's causing all of this, man-made CO2. And I think it's kind of interesting to look at um, how our emissions have changed over time and to compare that to some of the estimates that have been made. So there's a group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, a huge international group of scientists that got together. And in 1990, they, they got together and came up with various scenarios for how they thought global CO2 emissions might change in the future. And this, these are the different scenarios that they came up with. So basically they said there would be just a constant growth rate at the rate that they saw in 1990. 
up to the year 2030. And then by the year 2030, there would be all kinds of technologies that are developed that would help us to improve our efficiency in uh, reducing CO2 emissions. And so this kind of envelope here represents the range of different scenarios that were projected at that time. Now it's interesting because most of these projected a growth rate on the order of 1 to 2 percent. And in fact, this A1, F1 scenario that projected a 2.4 percent growth rate in the, in the CO2 emissions was considered outlandish at the time, that there was no way that we could ever grow CO2 that, that quickly or grow our emissions. So it's kind of interesting in, in hindsight to go back then and plot on top of that what our actual emissions were. So I put those on here. You can see that up to about 2000, we were, we were following that expected path. But starting in about 2000, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but basically between 2000 and 2008, our growth rate in CO2 emissions has grown by 3.4% per year. Much faster than ever projected um, by any of these uh, scientists and economists. Now, I've just plotted it here up to 2008. Who knows what happened in 2009? We had our big global recession, right? So we put on 2009, we actually saw a significant drop in our CO2 emissions that are associated with that, that recession. So economists and the scientists got together and they projected out from there and said, ah, oh, we saw this drop. What we'll see in the future then, they were projecting would basically just be a, this step function, this decrease in emissions, and we kind of move on from there. So the final point that I'll put on is the actual 2010 CO2 emissions. We saw the largest single year increase in atmospheric CO2 emissions over the last year coming out of that recession. And basically we're right back up on that path where we were uh, before. Now I show you this not to suggest that the global recession was good, but more to make the point that this, to me, proves that if we pay attention and we change our ways, we can actually make observable differences in our CO2 emissions. This is not something that's impossible and beyond our reach. Just, just cutting back on what we did in 2009 uh, was, was enough to drop our emissions. So here's a plot now of, in the US now, so the previous plot was for the globe. Um, this is now a plot for the US emissions by different sector from 1990 to 2008. So that same period that I was showing in the last plot. You can see that most of these, the industrial, commercial, residential CO2 emissions have been fairly flat. In fact, the industrial has actually been decreasing a little bit. The two main sectors that have shown all this growth over the last 20 years has been CO2 emissions from generating electric power and from transportation. And in fact, electric power represents 41% of our total emissions. And that's primarily from uh, power plants that burn coal and oil. We don't have to burn coal and oil to produce electricity. There are other ways. In fact, there was a 2007 Scientific American report that showed that with an investment of $420 billion, the U.S. could build a solar array in the, the desert southwest that could provide 69% of all the electricity needs for the United States. Now, $420 billion sounds like a lot of money, but if you think about, you know, put it in perspective, you know, that's less than, than the proposed budget cuts for, ne for le next year. You can, you can make a difference in that just by investing in green power. Almost all of these of the states now have offer green power solutions. These are ways of producing electricity that are not based on, that do not generate fossil fuels, either solar or wind or hydroelectric like we have up in, in my state. Some of these states even have uh, enforced mandatory green power laws. Although I think it's very interesting, and I put on here, there are actually very few states that actually use that green power themselves. But anyway, there, there, are, uh, there are federal regulations that are coming into effect that will help. For example, there's a federal law passed 
that uh, requires improvement in lighting efficiency. I don't know if you've heard about this, but if you've been to the store recently, you might notice that it's getting harder and harder to find 100-watt uh, light bulbs. That's because as of January of this year, manufacturers are not allowed to produce 100-watt light bulbs anymore. And in 2012, they're going to phase out the 75-watt light bulbs. That's, that that uh, reduction is anticipated to save us $6 billion a year by the time it's fully implemented. That's just in the energy savings of running those, the, doing that lighting. And that'll represent about a 30 million metric tons of CO2 that, that we've eliminated from our annual budget. So just, just placing six of your most frequently used light bulbs, replacing incandescent light bulbs with, for example, compact fluorescent light bulbs, you could reduce your own personal CO2 emissions by almost 600 pounds per year. Uh, another example would be uh, just air drying your clothes. Dryers use an amazing amount of electricity. And I'll even only ask you to do it six months of the year so you don't have to do it in the winter. But just doing it six months out of the year, you could save yourself almost 800 pounds of CO2 emissions. So the other big one is transportation. That represents about 28% of the total. And again, you see it increasing. Americans love their cars. Twice as many cars uh, in the United States than there are people. Who's driving those, that other set? Um, now we've, we've got our, we love our SUVs. I, I, I think hopefully maybe we've passed our, our SUV uh, fascination, although I still think this is an appropriate cartoon. But if you think about the average personal vehicle in the United States today gets about 17 miles per gallon. That means that we produce one pound of CO2 for every mile and a half that you drive. How far did you drive to come here today? All we have to do, if you increase the fuel efficiency of your car by 10 miles per gallon, I know you've been resisting going out and buying a new car, 10 miles per gallon, you could reduce your CO2 emissions by almost 4,400 pounds if you drive, something on the order of 10,000 miles a year. Even better yet, take the bus, take the train. If nothing else, buy an electric car. So let me just conclude by pointing out, I, I want to go back to the oceans and you know, point out the fact that the oceans are an amazingly diverse and wonderful place. There are many different interactions. Everything uh, interacts with each other. And what we're talking about, I, I just want to be clear that we're not talking about killing everything in the ocean. I, I don't want to suggest that at all. There will be winners and there will be losers. What we're talking about is just a reorganization of the oceans. CO2 levels have been high in the past and the oceans survived, but they looked very different than they do today. So we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to accept the oceans of the future? Are we okay with having more simple life forms, more bacteria, more jellyfish, more of the simple life forms as opposed to the, the higher order life forms. Most of that carbon that's stored in the ocean now is, as I mentioned, complexed in the form of other ions. It's not in the form of CO2 gas. So it is, it is rather difficult to get it out. The one exception to that is, um, so the, the uptake of man-made CO2 right now is thought to be a little over about two petagrams of carbon per year. The plants and animals in the oceans now currently naturally exchange about 70 petagrams of carbon per year. So just, but, but the nice thing is that it's, it's balanced. You know, they take up 70 petagrams and then they release 70 petagrams. So that's been balanced and it's just this small difference between those two large numbers that we're looking at now. So our concern with ocean acidification is, is exactly that. If we change that balance, then, then for example, if, if you were to kill off all the organisms in the ocean, which again, I'm not saying you would, but if you did, then 
um, the oceans could release a tremendous amount of CO2 just in a few years. The, the other kind of twist on that too is there's a lot of carbon stored in the oceans in the form of methane clathrates. This is frozen methane in the sediments that um, as the oceans warm become, can become destabilized and that's another way that the oceans can suddenly burp out a lot of CO2. But in general most of that 38,000 is, is pretty safe we think. Organisms in the ocean produce a, a compound, just a natural byproduct of their growth, particularly when they're growing very quickly, called dimethyl sulfide. It's not a CO2 gas, it's a sulfur gas. And when that comes out, so they produce that and it diffuses out into the atmosphere. Those sulfide particles can then act as cloud condensation nuclei and form clouds. And I, I guess what you're getting at is that if you increase the clouds, that increases the albedo, reflects more light back out into space, and potentially can change the global warming that's projected. Uh, this talk was not really about global warming, but that is a feedback that's um, been proposed in, in the whole climate system. So we know that organisms do that now. The question is how will that change in the future and how might that be affected by ocean acidification? And, and Basically, we don't really know. A lot of those um, of that DMS is formed from an organism that's called uh, a coccolithophore, which is a small planktonic, uh, it's a marine algae that produces a calcium carbonate skeleton. So that's one of the organisms that's been shown to be dramatically impacted by rising CO2. So if we uh, were to reduce the amount of growth of, of coccolithophores in the oceans, that could potentially reduce the DMS production and thus reduce the clouds that are formed there. On the other hand, uh, diatoms are another blooming organism. They produce a silica shell. So they do not seem to be impacted by rising CO2 and may in fact grow better under rising CO2, particularly if some of their competitors that produce calcium carbonate die off. So DMS formed by the the diatoms could actually increase. So that's a long way of saying we really don't know how that's going to change in the future. That's a loaded question. So I was, a few years ago, I was on a IPCC panel to looking at carbon capture and storage. We wrote a special volume and there was a whole chapter on ocean carbon capture and storage and it's amazing the different processes, the engineering solutions that people have come up with. The Japanese have this very elegant um, bomb of, of uh, dry ice that they form that they can drop in the ocean and the dry ice sinks down and transports carbon into the bottom of the ocean. At that time, it was thought that you could compress the CO2. If you get it below a certain level, about 3,000 meters, then the, then the compressed CO2 actually becomes more dense than seawater and it'll actually sink. If you put it in any shallower than that, it'll pop right up to the surface and it'll come right back out. So you gotta get it at least 3,000 meters. And then it sinks and the thought was, well, we could just make these huge lakes of pure CO2 on the bottom of the ocean of liquefied CO2. They've, since then, they've actually done some studies where they've gone out and actually added CO2 down to the bottom of the ocean. And what they found was uh, a little bit unexpected that, um, that that CO2 doesn't remain inert. It actually starts to entrain water and it starts to swell. And it grows and it grows and it grows until it becomes so thin that it ultimately, um, it won't stay there in, in the CO2 lake. So, so I guess my answer would be no, I don't think it's feasible for two reasons. One, even in the deep ocean, there are marine organisms. And if you, if you pump that CO2 into there, we know that you will kill them. I mean, those, that's pure CO2. That will kill, that will make huge dead zones on the bottom of the ocean. Now, maybe you don't care about that, but that's what'll happen. And I can guarantee you there are some people that'll <laughs> fight that. 
The other is that CO2 won't stay there. So at best, you're talking about keeping it maybe a few hundred years. Now you could argue that a few hundred years is better than nothing, but you put that together with the potential environmental impacts. Um, I don't think carbon storage in the oceans is, is likely to go very far. I mostly was talking about animals, I guess, in this talk. Um, we see impacts on plants as well. Um, it depends on which plants you're talking about. So um, the, these coccolis that I mentioned are marine algae. They're basically marine plants. They're the the coccolis and the diatoms are the two dominant primary producers in the ocean. And the coccolis form this calcium carbonate skeleton. Now they have shown in uh, in in uh, aquarium studies that the coccolis grown at high CO2 um, can actually grow naked. They 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 still can live even if they can't produce their own shell. But clearly they're making that shell for a reason. And you know we're we're concerned that 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 major primary producer will, will be negatively impacted in the future. Um, diatoms do not seem to grow faster, although again, as I said, if, if you reduce some of their competition, that may allow them to grow faster. Um, we do see some uh, marine plants like seagrasses uh, appear to grow actually faster and better under elevated CO2. And the cyanobacteria, the nitrogen fixers, um, seem to grow better. And most of the oceans actually are nitrogen limited. What's, what's limiting the rate at which the plants can grow in the ocean is the availability of nitrogen. So there have been those that have suggested that if you allow the nitrogen fixers to grow better, they're adding more nitrogen to the system, which would allow all the other plants to grow better too. So again, it's in that kind of nebulous range of uh, whether we could see an increase or a decrease. We don't really know at this point. Chlorophyll and primary production in the ocean is uh, unfortunately something that we don't have as good a handle on as you think we should. Um, we have satellites now that can observe uh, marine organisms, at least in the surface waters. And there have been a few studies published recently that have suggested that the global levels of, of chlorophyll is decreasing, has decreased over the last 50 years or so. Um, but there are a lot of those that, that refute that, um, partially because we know that there are uh, significant primary producers that live deeper than the satellites can see, which is basically just one wavelength of, of the light that they use. Um, and in situ studies where people have actually collected water samples and brought them on and measured the productivity directly do not seem to support that. So again, it's one of those we don't really know for sure how it's changing. Basically, no. So algae macroalgaes do seem to grow faster under elevated CO2 and there have been actually proposals suggesting that you could take the effluent from uh, power plants, you could scrub that CO2 and basically pump it into a, a, a greenhouse where you've got macroalgae growing in a giant pond and you're bubbling that CO2 through there and the, the algae are sucking it all up. The, the problem is that but that algae has a, a relatively short lifespan. You know, it's got a turnover rate that's on the order of months to, to a year. And yes, they will absorb that CO2, but if you allow that, that material to decompose, that CO2 comes right back out. So it has to be a two-part thing of growing the macroalgae, which, you know, has its own complications because it's not just CO2, you have to provide nutrients. It, it'd be like your lawn, you know, you'd, you'd have to fertilize it with nitrogen and phosphorus and, and that has consequences as well and has an expense. You could grow that, but even once you grow it, you would then have to somehow harvest it and bury it or do something with it so that CO2 doesn't come right out. 
I mean, basically, that's exactly where all this oil and gas came from, right? So think about it. Back in, back in the time of the dinosaurs, CO2 was much higher than it is today. It was, it was a much warmer planet. The sea level was higher. So there were, there were swamps everywhere. You think, of, you think of what was the climate like during the Jurassic period. And it was warm and swampy. Well, it turns out that swamps are huge sinks for CO2. They're very efficient at absorbing CO2 because you've got all that, all that plant matter that's growing and then it sinks down into the bottom of the bog, which quickly goes anoxic, which slows down, when it runs out of oxygen, it slows down the rate it, that it decomposes. It's all that swamp material that then got buried that got, and compressed and turned into oil and coal that were that we're burning out. What we're doing now, that we're, we're just pulling all that stuff right back out and putting it right back in the atmosphere where it was. So is it that far-fetched to believe that we're going back to a climate like we had during the Jurassic period when all that CO2, where it came from? So yes, that is a way to do it, but you would have to bury it because if you let it decompose, it just comes right back out. Well, again, this, this was specifically looking at, um, at rates of calcification in particular, how quickly calcium carbonate formed in the shells. And, um, of course, uh, most of the crustaceans don't, they have just a little tiny bit of calcium carbonate in their shell. It's mostly chitin. And um, one thing that's that is not frequently mentioned in a lot of these studies is the scientific process, you know, the, the normal scientific process, of course, is to try and just adjust one parameter at a time, right? So, so if you want to study the effect of CO2 on something, what you do is you give them everything else they could ever want except the CO2, and you expose them to the, the CO2 conditions you want. So these, these crustaceans that, that grew really well, they were put in high CO2, but they were also given as much food as they ever wanted to eat. So basically it's thought that they just grew faster really because they were being fed more. And, and that's really what you were seeing. 